Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28 today. Um, I want to start out by saying to you that some of you just need to get a grip, all right? Uh, Have you ever had that phrase said to you, I I need you to just get a grip, and some people say, I just need you to get a grip on life, and that makes sense because I I think there's different things that we run into in life where, like, we understand the importance of having, like, a good grip on something. So if you're learning to ride a bicycle for the first time, you want to grip those handlebars nice and tight so that you can steer yourself and hold on to it. You want to make sure you're part of that. If you are like me and you are very afraid of roller coasters for the first time, even though you know that there's safety precautions to make sure you don't come out of your seat, you know that you're holding on as tight as you can and you're white knuckling it. Uh, I told you that I've always been afraid of planes. Uh, I, I Somehow God has miraculously got me over that. And even on this uh, trip we were at this time, I was, I was laughing because I heard the lady beside me telling the individual side, I'm super nervous. This is like one of my first flights and I don't know what to do. And, and as we hit a little turbulence, you could see her just grab on. And, and I'm thinking to myself, lady, if this plane goes down, it doesn't matter what kind of grip you got, you know, like is just not going to save you, you know. So, But I also know the pressure of that. Uh, my wife and I, several years ago, um, she wanted to go parasailing. And out of my love for her, I said that I would do it. I hate heights. And the fact that there's just one little rope that's connected to the boat and you up in the air, that is not a thrill for me. My wife is thrill seeker, Okay. She is one of these ones that I remember she, um, my dad said he would pay for any of us that wanted to do bungee jumping. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. My wife was like, yeah, let's do it. And I mean, she got up there and just walked off like it was no big deal. I'm like, what is the matter with you? You know, like I don't even have any insurance on her. So I was concerned about that. You know, I got five kids here, you know. Um, So anyways, my wife, she's the daredevil. Um, We get on this uh, parasailing thing and I'm telling you, I gripped onto that thing as tight as I could. And and as we were going up, my wife was like, oh, isn't this so freeing? And I'm like, no. And she's like, isn't it so beautiful? I'm like, I can't look at anything. I am so nervous. I, I kept saying to her, I don't feel like I'm, I'm strapped in well, and, and I'm going to hold on. And, and, I'll, and she has not a care in the world, you know. She's just out there enjoying, honey, look at, look at this, you know. And I'm thinking, look, you don't understand the advantages that you have compared to the disadvantages I have, you know. For example, um, I cannot swim, you know. So if we go down... She can at least go around, you know? And she's like, well, you have a life preserver on. Again, she is thin. I am not. I don't trust that thing to hold me up. Not to mention, if we do go down in the water, I don't know what's underneath the water. And trust me, I look more appealing to a shark than you do in the water, okay? So a lot of things going wrong. But I'm telling you, I gripped that thing as tight as I could the whole time. And then eventually they, they pull us back in. And, I, and again, I was complaining all the time. Like, I, I just don't feel like I'm strapped in well and, you know, and all this. And she at the end, as we're complaining, she's like, isn't that great? I'm like, no. It was one of the worst experiences of my life, you know. And so anyway, so as we get back in, I kid you not, we stood up. And then hooked the one part. And my harness fell right off. And the guy goes, oops. He's like, that's never happened. I was like, I told you. know. So anyways, so there are some times that like you understand that there are times that we need to just grip with everything that we can. But there are times when you and I understand that it's okay. And especially when we're talking in a spiritual sense, that there are some things that we are holding way too tight to. Because we're afraid of just letting go of certain things. And what begins to happen to us as we're reading this passage is that certain things end up becoming stumbling blocks to us. And we can never fully enjoy the freedom of what it means to live in Christ. You know, I thought to myself, I would love to have that freedom that my wife does to just be out there and feel okay. You know, I often was jealous of people who could get on a plane 
and just feel this freedom of, of relaxing. And I'm telling you, that's the way I felt this last time. And when I was hearing this lady in the back, I kept thinking, oh man, these sound so ridiculous, you know, and, and, and all that. So, and by the way, just to let you know, I don't know what was going on, but four of the people that were around us were from Mount Gilead on the plane. So I had to be extra cautious about what I said and did, okay? Let's read together though, as we think about the idea of what it means to let go and then to regrip what I would say that we regrip in grace and we regrip to Jesus Christ. So Matthew 16, verse 21, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come to his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, every time I get up here, I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled with the way that you work through your word. And I thank you for um, allowing someone like me who um, doesn't have that much knowledge, who doesn't have a full understanding always of, uh, of, of the scriptures. But you take that time that we spend together and you elevate things and you bring things to mind and you begin to speak your word. I pray today, Lord, as we begin to share and as we begin to listen, I pray that if there's anything that I would get wrong in the scriptures, that you would clean it up in the ears of your people because what's important today is that they hear your voice and not mine. In your name we pray, amen. I love the way this uh, passage starts out uh, because it was just interesting to me, but the way the passage starts out in verse 21, I call it uh, part A of it, but it says, from that time on. And I started thinking about that. What does that mean from that time on? And I really feel like what we're doing here in Scripture is it's sort of a segue about what's to come. It sort of sort of mentions a point of like, here's the way we've been going, but from this time on, because of what we just experienced, there is a new mission or there is new understanding that Jesus is going to give his disciples. And so when Matthew writes this as one who's been with Jesus from the beginning to the end, he's writing, but there was a moment that happened. And from that time on, things began to open up for us or things began to change. So what was that moment? That moment happens to us in the previous verses of 13 through 20. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea and Philippi, he, said, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah as one of the prophets. But then Jesus redirects the question. He says, listen, I get what other people are saying, but now that you have been around me, what do you think? But what about you, he asks. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, who I love, is just this kind of bold person who gets up and stands up and says things. It says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then Jesus grants this blessing over Peter. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So in other words, from that moment on, the moment was that Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. 
And because of this, what I want you to understand is that once Peter and once the disciples understood who God was, then it allowed them to go deeper. It allowed Jesus to speak new things into their life and take them into a deeper walk. And I have to tell you, church, once you come to the realization of who Jesus is, it should push you to go deeper. You should recognize that this is a God who loves you, who cares for you, and this should be a moment in time that encourages us to go deeper. I was reading this story the other day about a Swiss engineer. His name is George, and I may mess up this last name, but De Mastral. And he had a, um, he had a from that time on moment. In 1941, he returned from a walk with his dog to notice that they were both covered in tiny barbs of the cockleber plant. On closer inspection, George saw that the birds were shaped like tiny hooks, which snagged on the loops of his clothing and his dog's fur. Fascinated, he began to try to create this hook and loop fabric, an endeavor that would ultimately take him more than 10 years. In 1955, he patented Velcro, a name that combines the French word velour and crochet, which is the idea that it means basically velvet and hook. Despite the moniker, George's creation was made from nylon. And it took the fashion industry, it took NASA, it took them a while to catch up, and then all of a sudden they began to use Velcro and all their stuff. And by the way, it wasn't until 1921, way after this, that they figured out a way to make it even quieter. You see, George had a moment when he saw something and he couldn't get it out of his mind and he thought, there has got to be a way to create this same sort of attraction, this same sort of connectivity And he spent 10 years going deeper with it and ended up creating something that the world uses every day now. Many of us, I think, if you and I were to share our stories, I think many of us would have one of those from that time on moments. I'll never forget my, uh, I I found out like later in life that, because I've never seen my grandparents ever smoke and I found out that my uh, grandma Osborne was a big smoker at one time, but when she gave her heart to Jesus, I found out that he took that away from her. I had my grandpa Kennedy, who was also, I guess, a chain smoker, and what happened to him is that the Surgeon General began to put a warning on the cigarettes, and he decided that from that moment on, I'm no longer going to smoke. And so he gave it on, but he would say it was from that moment on. I've heard of people starting jobs or starting careers because they had a moment where a nurse may have have had a moment when somebody needed cared for and, and she thought, I need to be that person. So from that moment on, she decided to care for somebody. You can have a moment where somebody was working outside with their hands and building something and all of a sudden they're like, I really enjoy building. And so they become a contractor because... From that moment on, this is what I want to do. You have a student that sits underneath a teacher and is so inspired by that teacher that from that moment on, all they can think about doing is to get out there and teach. Like there are some series from that moment on that we begin to change our life. Some of you had a moment when you were dating your spouse. And there was a moment in that dating process early on when you had a moment. And you thought, this is the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. And from that moment on, that's what you committed yourself to. You held a newborn baby in your arms for the first time. And from that moment on, you thought, I will love this child with all that I can, no matter what happens in their life. Because from that moment on, this child means something to me. I knew from certain moments in my own kids' lives when they understood the value of things and when they understood what it means to, um, to take on responsibility that they could mow the yard. <laughs> I knew from that moment on it was okay to entrust them with that. Listen, I was at an altar when I was a teenager. I sat in a wooden pew And I heard this message of Jesus. And I was confronted with my own sin and my own shame. 
And I felt this drawing of the Holy Spirit that said, you need to get things right. You need to ask for forgiveness. And I'll never forget going down and kneeling at an altar and just beginning to cry with the weight of what I felt my sin was all about. And from that moment on, I decided that I would follow Christ. Some of you have had that moment from that moment on when Christ dealt with you in such an intense way, you knew that you had to go deeper with him in some way. Going deeper basically means this, means that you get, to hand, you get a handle on truth. And so verse 21 says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. You know, that's interesting that he says that because he's beginning now to say, look, I get it. You guys understand it. And since Peter has declared that I am, in fact, the Messiah and all of you agree with it, I think that I can give you guys a little bit more truth. I think that you're going to be able to understand the things that I'm getting ready to tell you. And so he begins to help them go deeper. He says, look, basically, you guys have had this perception that we're going to overcome the world through might. And he says, I need you to get a grip now. I need you to come to a better understanding because what I'm going to tell you is probably going to knock your socks off because here's what's going to happen. I'm not coming in the conquering way that you think, but here's what's going to happen. I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests. They're going to say some pretty bad things about me, and then I'm going to be put up on a cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to bleed out, and then I will rise again. Do you understand what he was telling them? Like, we're going to go through some major stuff. We're going to go through some major heartache. And he says, I believe in you guys enough that I think you can now handle the truth of what is going to happen. And so I want to take you down that path. Now, maybe you've had a moment like that in your own life. Maybe you've had a moment where in raising your kids that you understand that, that, that they understand your love for them, that they understand that, uh, that they can handle a little bit more things that you probably have kept from them. And so all of a sudden, you're going to start to reveal some truths. And you're going to start to reveal some, maybe some dirty secrets from your past. Maybe you might reveal to your kids, like, listen, you've known mom or you've known dad this way, but I want you to understand that when I was in the sin, here are the addictions that I had. Here are some of the mistakes that I made. Here are some of the roads I went down that just weren't very good. And you can trust your kids today because you understand that they can handle the truth. And you think that if you tell them the truth, then it will prevent them from going down the same roads. And as tough as those conversations are, as tough as it is to admit our faults or to admit some of the pain that's going to happen, like it's very freeing to be able to do that, to say to your kids, like, look, to make sure that you guys don't go down the same path, Let me just be real. Let me just be open with you. And Jesus is having this real moment with his disciples. Hey, guys, look. There's going to be some major suffering that's going to take place. But this has to happen. And at the end of the day, you're going to recognize the resurrection. You're going to recognize the freedom and all that took place. And so even though those intense conversations may happen at times, even though those honest situations may happen... There's a freedom that then comes as a result. There are times when we sit down our kids and we tell them some of the things that that we're ashamed of. And our kids are like, whoa, what? And watching them try to process and watching them try to handle that can be hard. It can be hard for them to wrestle with it. But when they finally wrap their minds around it, we hope that it'll prevent them from making the same mistakes. Going deeper also means not that you just get a handle on the truth, but it also means that as we go deeper, you let go of your will and you submit to his. So in verse 22 through 23, here's what's happening in the story now. So Jesus is letting them know, like, this is what's going to happen. And, and then Peter, watch him, he took, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? Peter pulls Jesus aside And he says, Jesus, I heard what you've just said, but I want you to know, never, Lord, he said, shall this ever happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. 
You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I want you to think about this moment again. So you remember in the previous verses when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Who, st- who stands up right away? Peter. Peter is always the one that is standing up right away. And Peter says, when asked the question, who do you say I am? He says, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And now we have Peter looking at the Son of God, the creator of the world, and Peter is now rebuking him saying, no, what you just said doesn't make sense. I'm not going to let you go down that road. That's a bold move, by the way. I mean, think that's a bold move. You take the person who is the son of God, you take him aside, and you get on him about what he says has to happen. And Jesus' response to him is what? Get behind me, Satan. Now, if I was Peter, I'd be like, okay, okay. what was that all about? I mean, you just told me that you were going to build a church on me. You just propped me up and told me how great I was going to be and how I could, you know, have the keys of the kingdom and how I can set people free. And now you're calling me the devil. Did you just build me up to tear me down? And what Jesus was trying to get Peter to understand is, Peter, if you go down this road, you're going to be a stumbling block to what really needs to happen. Oftentimes when I'm reading these things, I think to myself, even in my childhood and and even as I have kids, that um, I knew how much my parents loved me because I knew the way they took care of me. I knew the times we played games together. I knew the things that they had bought me. I knew all the advance of, of mine that they had gone to. Like, I knew all that stuff. And so I knew that they loved me. But there were times when they would say stuff like, you need to clean your room, or you need to do your homework, or you need to do this. And I thought to myself, no, I don't want to do that. I don't understand how that will help me. I'm not going to do it, right? And at the end of the day, I still knew what? I still knew that my parents loved me and that they still had authority over me. Now, the older I've gotten, I've realized what my parents are trying to do is train me because they wanted to make sure that when I'm on my own, like even though they had those hard conversations, even though they tried to get me to do my chores, what they were doing is they were preparing me for a time when they wouldn't be there. And Jesus was preparing Peter for that moment. He said, Peter, there are some things that you're just holding on too tightly to. And I know that I've just rocked your world with what I'm saying, but if you don't let these things happen, you're going to be a stumbling block to what God really wants to do. In Africa, in order to catch a monkey, what they'll often do is they'll take like a coconut and uh, they'll, they'll cut a small hole into it. And it's a hole big enough just for the um, monkey to get its hands in. And then they'll put peanuts in there and then they'll tie a string to the coconut. And what they'll do, they'll wait for those monkeys to stick their hands in there and the monkey will grab the peanuts and they'll hold on to the peanuts. And then when they try to pull their hand out because now they've made a fist, they can no longer get that hand out of that coconut. And so what the person will do is trying to trap the monkey. Once the monkey grabs onto that, the person will pull the string and pull that coconut along with the monkey towards it. And you know what? Because the monkey wants those peanuts so bad, it will not let go. And because of it, it'll ultimately be captured. If that monkey would just let free of those little bit of peanuts and pull its hand out, it could probably go over somewhere else and find other peanuts or find other sources of food. But because they have that right now and that will give them instant gratification, they will not let go and they'll just hold on to it as tightly as they can. And church, here's the deal. The devil wants to entrap you. And there are things that he has put in your life that he wants you to cling to and he wants you to hold on to. And what Jesus wants you to do is he just wants you to let go of those things, pull your hand out, enjoy all of this that he has provided for you. But some of you continue to hold on to that one thing. Why? Because it gives me satisfaction right now. 
Some of you have addictions that you need to let go of and you need to get help. But you cling on to it so bad, and I'll just only do it one more time, or just give me a little bit longer. And God's saying, look, I want you to let go of it. I want you to pull your hand free, because the road you're going down isn't great. And I'm not just talking about, like, drug addictions or alcohol addictions that we may have. I'm talking about, like, porn addictions as well. I'm talking about anything that takes you out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you are so addicted to the things of this world that at the end of the day will provide nothing for you. They're all temporary. But what is eternal is the things of God. Jesus wants you to let go of the things of this world, the things that you think will provide pleasure and will take care of it. And he's saying, listen, I want you to trade all of this away because this is just a moment in time. From this moment on, let go so that you can enjoy for the, from that time on, or from that moment on, you can enjoy eternity with a God who loves you. But so many of us are like the monkey, we just cling and cling and cling. And because of that, we'll find ourselves captured. And because of that, we'll never truly know what freedom is. And Jesus wants to let go of that thing. He told Peter, Peter, I need you to let go of what you're thinking and of what you're concerned about. And if you continue to go down this path, you're going to be a stumbling block to those who really need me. He goes on then in verse 24, and I love what happens because basically what we need to understand is that you and I, we carry the weight of suffering And that suffering that we experience, that really allows us to extend grace where it needs to be found. Verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And again, he reiterates, there are some things in this world that you need to let go of. Some of you probably have accumulated great wealth. And to be honest, there are some people around you that probably need some help financially. There are some people, like, you're pretty good going through life, and it's been pretty calm, and there are some people around you that's going through some real storms in life, some real heartaches, some real concerns, and they need you to just step in and check on them to see how they're doing. There are some people that are going through some real major diseases right now that are spending time in the hospital, and they need somebody to step up who's doing well, and just says, for this moment in time, like, I know that I'm enjoying life, but I'm willing to strip myself down of these things right now because of what you're going through. And I'm willing to surrender myself so that you can be helped. You know, I think parents, I think what we do as parents is sacrificial by nature. There'll be a lot of things, a lot of trips, and a lot of things I'd love to do. But at the end of the day, I sacrifice them all. Why? Because I want my children to have the best experience that they can. And Jesus wants people to really feel valued and enjoy this life. And there's some weight that comes with suffering. I mean, there's a lot of weight. Imagine this, like, imagine you understand that as a parent that you've given and given and given yourself to your kids. But they may reject all that and they may be rude to you at times. But at the end of the day, what you're hoping is that all of this that I'm suffering through, though, at the end of the day, realize how much I love them and I hope that they grow up to be really good people. Jesus said, look, I'm willing to go through this suffering And I understand that people still may be rude to me. I still understand that they may mock me and they may reject everything that I'm offering. But at the end of the day, what Jesus wanted us to know is that we are loved, that we are cared for, and that he's willing to go through all that suffering because of his love for you. How powerful is that? Christ said, I'm willing to take on the cross, why? because out of his love for humanity. That's how much he loved you. And when he was talking to the disciples, he was telling them, hey guys, here's the deal. All this conquering stuff that you thought was gonna take place, here's the truth. You're gonna suffer some major problems. You're gonna carry some major weight of how the world's gonna view you and see you. But at the end of the day, you're gonna be a blessing to those around you because you're gonna follow my steps and you're gonna deny yourself and you're gonna take on this cross and you're gonna follow me. 
So as you go deeper, what happens is the moment that you and I recognize who Christ is, that he is the Messiah, that he cares about us, you and I, we get into his word. We listen to other speakers talk about him. We begin to talk more about Christ. We begin to figure things out. And I'm not saying that has to happen 24 hours a day, but what I'm telling you is that as a relationship grows, there is more time that we spend with him. And as I read his word and as I listen to his spirit, there are times that, that the Holy Spirit says, Chuck, I want, I want you to check yourself on this. And I want you to change this about yourself. And I have to submit to that. Why? Because in my love for Christ, I want to go deeper. And some of you have just touched the surface of your relationship with God, and he wants you to go deeper. And church, we got to go deeper. Because if we don't get very deep, then the moments those storms and the moments those trials happen, listen, we're going to be thrown right out because we have no depth to us. We have nothing to really hold us down. And so you and I need to go deeper. He says this in verse 25. And through 28, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have drawn. Truly I tell you, Some who are standing here will not taste death before they will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus simply reminds us that you can have all these riches. You can have all these things that that the world can buy. You can have all the money. You can have all the cars. You can have all the mansions. You can have all this stuff. But at the end of the day, if you don't have Christ, you have nothing when you leave this earth. And all that will amount to zero. But if you and I can say to Christ, I'm yours, then we gain eternity. See, you free from the the things that are temporary and we begin to come to the place where we hold to the things that are eternal. But that's the idea of letting go And as we let go of that, and as we find the freedom in that, guess what we grip onto? We grip on to Jesus. And we hold tight. And we experience a grace and a love that no one else has ever bestowed on us. It's a grace and love that says to us, I know your mistakes, I know your past, I know your junk. And in spite of all of that, I died for you on a cross so that you could be loved. And church, Just as we are loved, we have the responsibility to love others as well. Would you stand with me this morning? And if you wouldn't mind just for a moment, if you would just uh, close your eyes. And uh, if there is anyone this morning that says, man, there are some things that I'm holding too tightly onto that are sins. And there are things I need to give up. If you want to be like me, (laughs) and and, I mean, not exactly like me. You don't want to be like me, trust me. But... If there are some things that you want to let go of and you want to come down the altar and pray, I just want to make that available to you at this time. And for some of you, that may be very difficult to come out, but if you want one of us pastors to pray with you, we would love to do that with you this morning. If coming forward, though, is uncomfortable for you and you would say this morning, Pastor, there are some things that I've just been holding too tightly onto and I need to let it go. If that's you this morning, you just want to raise your hand and say, would you remember me in a prayer this morning? I want to do that. Thank you up front here. Thank you over on the sides here. Got that. Thank you. Thank you in the front here. Thank you in the back on the sides. Thank you. So many hands raised. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to a place not because somebody has spoken a word, but because you have spoken to our hearts. And we recognize, Father, that we all come with a lot of faults and a lot of mistakes. I mean, sin is really, what we say, falling short of the glory of God. And Father, it feels like we live moment by moment falling short. Like, did we do enough? Did we pray enough? Did we love enough? But this is where your grace reaches in. You said what you did on the cross was enough for us. And then you ask us to take on that same weight that we would deny ourselves and take on the cross. But Father, there are so many of us that even though we've come to the realization that you are God, we, like Peter, rebuke that and say, no, 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 Lord, that's not the way you forgive. That's not the way you do things. Let me show you how you do things. 
But the truth is when we do that, we try to play God. Let's just take you at your word. And let's figure out, Father, the things that you reveal to us that we need to let go. So for those this morning who raised their hands and just said, there's some things that I need to let go of, Father, help us to let go. Father, if you need to pry our hands open, pry our hands open so that we will let go and that we can remove that and enjoy the freedom that there is found in a relationship with you. And help us figure out new ways to go deeper, whether it's sitting here in a service, whether it's listening to something online or, or opening the Bible and reading your word and just allowing you to speak to us. Allow us to have those moments and allow us to create a day that says, from this moment on, I intend to live differently. Father, we thank you for meeting with us now, for dealing with our hearts, for dealing with our minds. And may we not leave this place just hearing another word, but may we leave this place today changed and understanding that there is a God who deeply loves us and wants relationship with us. We love you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, church, thanks for being so attentive today and and walking through this with us. Uh, I pray that you have a blessed week and go with God. Thanks again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.